All right, we are live. So, so, so excited to be here with you today. This is another installation of Practical Creativity, our 21 out of 30 day challenge to go live with leaders and in the arts and entrepreneurial community to unpack the creative process, demystify it so that we can actually make use of it in our lives and our work. So I'm really excited today to have my special guest, Maureen O'Brien, uh, with us to just share all about what's going on in her world. So Maureen, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're up to right now. Sure. So I am the Senior Vice President for Institutional Advancement at New World Symphony. My background is from a Pulse concert at New World from back in the day when we could have 1,600 people packed in the hall, and hopefully we'll be back to that at some point. But as you know, Marta, because we go way back, <laughs> we've been working in the arts since uh, I was in college and beyond. And you and I met in New York working at Midori and Friends. So I had a couple of jobs in New York before I moved to Arizona to work at the Musical Instrument Museum. Came to Miami about five years ago now. Can't wow. believe it's been five years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. So, and then for fun, I still play the flute, dance tango. And I've uh, been doing a lot more cooking these days, just like all of us. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. But these times are bringing out our other kinds of creative sides that um, used to involve other, other things. So, right. <laughs> oh, well, tell us a little bit more about, so you said Pulse. Your background is from Pulse, which is yeah. a concert unlike any I've, I've ever been to anywhere else. Tell us just yeah. a little bit more about what Pulse is all about and kind of the purpose of it and how it uses technology since we're doing so much of that right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we, we actually aren't using the Pulse name anymore. We're calling it Late Night at New World Symphony. Okay. Um, and it's a great evening of DJ and orchestra um, together on the stage. We move the seats back. The seats in the hall are able to be moved back so that we can make room for people to be on the floor really close to the musicians with their drinks and there's a lot as you can see all the lights that are up there so we have a fantastic uh, lighting designer Lulu Kritzik and wonderful video team led by Clyde Scott and they create all these amazing projections to really turn the hall into a club essentially. Yeah. Sounds good that's so great it's one of my favorite experiences at New World and it's just always so great to, it's really not something you can experience and understand unless you're there. Uh, so we can talk about it, but when you're at Pulse, it's just like this, all of your senses are engaged. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. And one of many, many things that New World does to, uh, to appeal to, to reach out to, and to capture the hearts of new audiences. So tell us right now, how is, uh, how is New World adapting to this like new normal of mm -hmm. uh, whatever we're going through right now? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think we're all struggling in our own ways, but one good thing about New World is that the building was really wired for this kind of technology, and it's something that we've been experimenting with for even longer than that, but, you know, longer than the building, so more than 10 or 11 years. So I think we're a little bit better poised than some organizations to react quickly, um, as evidenced by the fact that within like a week or two, we had a completely new product, a new um, concert format that we were putting out online, which we're calling Archive Plus. So Michael Tilson Thomas, MTT, our uh, artistic director, dreamed up this idea to basically take um, some concerts from our archive, which are mostly wall cast concerts that we've recorded over the last number of years, and then have uh, a live conversation in the present with some alumni, um, guest artists, fellows that were part of that performance to show that conversation before you get to watch the archival concert. So it's a really interesting mixture of personal conversation, getting some context from the people that were part of the performance, and then getting to enjoy the performance. So we've released, I think, four episodes now. They come out every Thursday. Okay. And the plan is to do eight of them, so about halfway through um, the series of new, new events. And then the fellows themselves, um, everybody, um, they came to us with this idea. We also were hoping we could do some, continue to do some live performance, and they're doing that um, live from their living room uh, every Friday night on Facebook at 7 p.m. 
they're doing chamber music um, with social distancing. So it's, you know, solos, duos, mm -hmm. they're introducing the pieces and just going live every Friday night with an hour long performance. So you can enjoy in the next one tonight at seven. And that's live on Facebook, yes? On Facebook, uh -huh. the page? Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I have tuned into a couple of them. It's yes, been really, thank you. really neat to see. <laughs> And yeah. to know that the, the fellows are still here, even though they're not um, performing concerts at New World Center, they are very much still here continuing their training, which is, which is awesome. Hey, Sam. Yep. So, excellent. Um, tell us just a little bit, again, what is the name of that program? Archive Plus? Mm -hmm. And new episodes come out every Thursday. Every we'll Thursday. We'll put the links in the in the show notes on YouTube Thanks. so that we have them. And that is so exciting. And I love what you're saying, which is, I feel like New World Symphony is just such a family. And so when you, when you are exposed to the concerts, there's never a time that you don't feel like MTT or somebody is having a conversation with you. There's always mm -hmm. something that's, it's not just, here's the music. It's like, here's the composer that we composed, you know, we, commissioned to write the piece and so there's a lot of learning obviously it's a music academy do you want to yeah. tell us just for for those of us who are not as familiar with new world what is what is this thing new world symphony a lot of people think sure. it's a professional orchestra but tell us exactly what it is the mission sure yeah so we are an orchestral academy so we are an educational institution but we're also a performing arts organization the fellows uh, if they're granted a fellowship which is very competitive to get in as you know we only accept a very small percentage of the applicants that we get, and they all come from prestigious music programs, universities, most of them with, all of them with bachelor's degrees, many of them with masters, and some with doctorates. And if they win a fellowship with us, it's a three-year fellowship. Um, they get to continue to hone their craft. They perform almost 70 concerts a year. So it's a very robust schedule, pretty much every weekend between September and May, they're performing and then many weeknights as well with other projects. And they get the benefit of learning from MTT, who spends about 12 weeks out of our 35 week season with us. We bring in other guest artists, we bring in coaches from many orchestras around the country. So, you know, most musicians have had um, one teacher or professor, right? And you and I both had that experience in college, right? You studied oboe and I studied flute. So we had our one teacher, we had a lesson with them every week. And by the time they get to New World, we're really encouraging them to find their own voice. So there's not one particular teacher they're working with. Instead, they are starting to really make those artistic and musical decisions themselves with the benefit of feedback from their colleagues, the coaches that we bring in, the guest artists and conductors. Amazing. Yeah. We had Lisa Husseini on earlier in the week and she was talking about being a coach in a very different way, which is more mm -hmm. on the mindset and the career side but the coach is actually coaching like you would have a coach in an athletic uh, setting, helping you do the work better uh, on sound, intonation, and also artistic choices and all sorts yep. of things. And wellness. I mean, some of the things that you talked about with Lisa, I'm sure, you know, we cover with, um, there's yoga, there's, um, you know, all these holistic ways that we approach. How do you have a career that's healthy and sustainable? Um, performance psychologist, you know, all kind meditation, all kinds of things that are offered to the fellows to sort of wrap around the musical experience to make sure that they're healthy and can have a long career. Amazing, amazing. So tell us just a little bit on. So you're you're head of fundraising, mm -hmm. and um, what is it? External advancement, something. There's a new title. Institutional for advancement. Yeah. So it also encompasses public relations now. Excellent. Tell us just mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, what's it like to raise money right now? What's, what are the conversations happening? Where are you seeing the need? How are you guys um, recalibrating if you're having to do that? I'm not even sure, but. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, everyone, everyone's recalibrating right now. Um, our initial instinct was to just call and reach out to all of our donors. So within a week um, of the crisis first kind of starting, you know, we had made the call to have everybody work from home and we divvied up the list of major donors and trustees and we just started calling them. Um, and I think that was, that's a really important step that everyone needs to take. It's just first checking in human to human. How are you? Where are you? Are you okay? Are you healthy? Are you safe? Are you worried about a family member? Are you worried financially? Um, so it was more of just checking in to see where people were 
And I think people really appreciated that. I mean, some people don't have as much family or, you know, everyone's circumstance is different, but everyone was excited to get the call, to know that we were okay. And then eventually to start understanding the things that we're doing content wise. But really the first step was just, are you okay? We're okay. You know, let's just get that established. Um, And then, you know, kind of moving on from there, we're continuing to have those check-ins. I wouldn't say we're actively soliciting as much right now. Um, You know, I think for organizations that have that are health and human services or that have an emergency relief fund, it's really appropriate to consider, you know, to keep going with those asks. We will be, you know, asking. Certainly, we're not going to to stop. But in this period, I think you have to be really sensitive to the tone of your communications and just be respectful that this is affecting every person and their network and ecosystem and family in a different way. And just be generous, you know, with that and listen for the cues that people are giving you. So some people, you can tell in that first conversation, they were going to be ready to hear from you again and talk about content. Other people had major concerns about their family or we're really nervous about the economy. And so it just, it's not the right time to to go and have a conversation about giving. That being said, we have had a few people who come forward to say, we know this is going to be a really hard time for you and we want to make a contribution now, which is beautiful and amazing. Um, We just had that happen with a foundation yesterday and it was, you know, a surprise to us, but such a beautiful gesture that they have the capacity to do this and have chosen to reach out to many of their existing grantees and give a no strings attached, you know, didn't even have to fill out an application, you know, what's your bank account, let us send you the money. So mm-hmm. for the funders that are able to do that, that is certainly a beautiful and appreciated, you know, gesture. Um, but certainly there are people saying, you know, I'm, it's going to take me a little longer to pay my pledge. I'd like to talk to you about a payment plan. Can you check back in, back in with me in a few months? So we know that just like every organization, next season is going to be tough. We're going to be affected by those delays or by people having to make different choices about where their discretionary income is going or whether they have any discretionary income at this point. So, you know, I think um, it's hard. What we're doing is essentially imagining multiple possible futures, multiple scenarios. Um, And one thing I wanted to offer that might be helpful to others is something called the axes of uncertainty. It's a tool that our mutual friend, Christina Boomer, passed along to me. She learned about it, I think, in her grad school program. Mm. Uh, And it's something that futurists use. Mm. And I had never been familiar with it, but she forwarded it. And it was like at a moment when we were trying to, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, we were just starting to try to imagine what we were, how to plan for next year. And it came at the perfect time because essentially it allows you to plot different continuums of what might happen. And you can do that from the public health crisis side of things. So you could say, okay, we're going to imagine on one side of the scenario that, you know, we, things are markedly better within six months. You know, there's not as much social distancing required versus the other extreme, which is maybe we have to continue the social distancing for a full 12 months. And, you know, that's one continuum. And then you, you brainstorm kind of everything that's out of your control, all these macro, you know, things to do with the economy, politically, um, you know, anything, religion, like what are the trends that are going to happen? It's also very cathartic to have that brainstorming session because you get to put out there all the things you can't control and all the fears and everything that might happen. You just put it out there. And then you also brainstorm um, from an internal perspective, decisions that you have some control over. So uh, also on a continuum. So we could decide to, you know, do X or Y. We could decide um, to, I don't know, let me give an example. Um, We could decide to shorten the season, for example, or not, you know, so you put, you, you put them on um, extremes. So continuum, and then you juxtapose them like (laughs) <laughs> up across <laughs> to work with my Zoom background, um, but you, you plot them on an X and Y axis, and then you go through a brainstorming session of defining and describing each of these possible scenarios. So what I think is beautiful about the exercise is you actually find opportunity that you didn't expect. And some of the discussions, yeah, they're really hard because the scenario that you're imagining is worst case scenario. It's not that much fun to think about, but you, you still, you do that. Then sometimes you get around to one of the quadrants and you think, wow, you know, we should be doing that anyway, even mm-hmm. if this weren't happening. So we found a couple of things in there, those gems that I tried to 
to stick to, which is um, discovery of things that we think, you know, this could actually be an existential threat if we don't do whatever it is that you discover, you know? So we've been using that a little bit to help um, plan. And then another colleague, Siggy, who you used to work with pretty closely, who we know is an expert in design thinking is gonna help. He has helped us design an opportunity for the entire staff to get involved um, in brainstorming using the how might we framework. So we've kind of thought about um, some different questions, you know, how might we deliver, how might we surprise and delight our donors online? How might we deliver a compelling musical experience to people via the internet? Things like that. And then we're going to invite the entire team to um, participate in that. And again, I think I truly believe, you know, good ideas can come from anywhere. And it's also powerful to have more people thinking about those things. So we're trying to find ways to um, create a positive space for us to collaborate and in cross departmental ways and think about and envision what an online world, what does the online world of New World Symphony look like? What could it look like? Mm -hmm. What opportunities do we have? I love that. Um, Olga Granda was on a couple days ago and she's building something that is not defined yet. Like they're, they're figuring it out and they have the spaces. But one of the things that she's been talking about is baking in that there just is going to have to be an evolution. And I think this, mm -hmm. is, this is an excellent time that a lot of organizations are having to think about like how do we evolve, but to have an actual framework that number one lets you say the scary thing <laughs> and number two gives you like a process to work through and like you're saying find those areas of opportunity i think is really helpful a lot of us initially were just living in the fear and the what does this mean and the discomfort and mm -hmm. the uncertainty but i think when you're able to be present and find a way to i, I guess tim ferris calls it negative visioning where you're like what's the absolute worst thing and then what is what from there starts to unleash the opportunities um, or to unveil them, I think is, is really pretty awesome. Wow, that's, that's so great. And to have the whole community of New World really participating, the whole team in that how might we conversation, that's exactly something I'd expect from, from New World that really embraces innovation. And part of innovation is sometimes you do it on the fly, right? Um, mm -hmm. Change yeah. can be very surprising. We can be disrupted. So it's really exactly. great to hear that. Yeah, I think this is completely unprecedented because you have multifactorial uncertainty. You have public health uncertainty, you have economic uncertainty, and you don't, nobody knows the answer of where those things are going to continue to intersect when this thing is going to resolve itself. And I truly believe like multiple paradigms will have shifted. And when we come back to whatever our quote unquote normal is, it's not going to be the same, right? So how do we, we don't want to get left behind. How do we think about how things might have changed, but you have to build in enough flexibility and nimbleness to course correct. And I mean, I'm finding every single day things are changing. Certainly on a weekly basis, our thinking is changing and you just have to continue to, to connect with each other. We're having a lot of meetings, you know, with our teams we're trying to also socialize. We're having virtual happy hours. We had a happy hour for the whole team around um, Poetry Month. So everybody brought a poem and, you know, either read it or an image that they found to be poetic. And, you know, there's many of us that haven't ever had a beer with each other, right? So it actually, there are some really lovely moments of connecting with colleagues around something that isn't even work-related that uh, helps relieve some of the, the stress and tension of the whole situation. Um, it is fatiguing, as I'm sure you're experiencing, to be on video all the time. I find that the meetings are exhausting in a different way. So trying to find way, you know, moments of levity and you know, people using their funny Zoom backgrounds or whatever <laughs> <laughs> helps. Yes. But um, you know, at least we have these tools. It helps to be able to see each other even if we can't be physically together right now. Absolutely. And I think an organization that takes the opportunity to build team and to build uh, relationships is one that's going to really weather anything. Corey Davis was on a couple weeks ago and he was talking all about how basically resiliency is a team sport. And mm -hmm. if we're not creating connections, we, in times that are good, in times that are bad, like we're really not able to do anything alone. So the illusion that we have to have it all together and have it all figured out 
it doesn't serve us. But when we do reach out and we communicate, I love also what you're saying about first response is really like reaching out to human beings. Are you okay? I'm okay. Are you okay? Because again, your donations, it's not just like a piggy bank. You, you, this is a human being that you're having a relationship mm -hmm. with. And the most important thing is the baseline. And, but if you're not communicating, then you're not able to really develop those relationships and, and take it further into any other sort of dynamic of any relationship. So right. tell me a little bit, I've heard something about one of your trustees and a, a, a new initiative. Tell us a little bit about that. Some good news, some happy news. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Will Osborne is one of our trustees and I think his son, I believe is based in New York or Connecticut and happened to be down here when the quarantining happened. And so he um, is in the restaurant business or in the food and beverage industry. And he and Will got to talking about something they could do to help in this time. So they've created a nonprofit called Meals for Heroes Miami. And people are able to donate um, to provide meals for first responders. And they're also, by virtue of doing that, employing local restaurants that need the business. And so they've got this great, you know, partnership, this circle going on. Um, they very quickly formed 501c3. I think they have a fiscal sponsor already so they can take donations. Um, and they have partners, Baptist, Jackson, Mount Sinai, mm. um, some of the testing centers. And they're delivering something like 500 meals a day. So we've been trying to support him however we can. And, you know, we're really proud of him and others that um, just take this time to be very selfless and think about how we can help um, the community. So yeah, you can find that at mealsforheroesmiami.org, I think. Okay, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes on, on YouTube for sure. That's such good news and what a win-win. Really yeah. looking at opportunity mindset here. That's absolutely fabulous. So tell us also a little bit about your own creative practice. We talked about doing more cooking, but you mm -hmm. are a flutist, you are a tango dancer, and you know, to be doing tango is like a very close thing. So how are you in the age of physical distancing? Mm. Yeah, the tango community is really struggling right now. There's all these Facebook groups that have been created and they each have their own set of rules. So there's one that's called, I'm not dancing tango and I'm doing this instead and you are forbidden to post tango content there. So I think there are some people who, it's too painful for them to watch tango right now. So they're posting all the things that they're, you know, that they're not doing. People are trying to do virtual milongas, which essentially is somebody DJing, um, and people are either dancing on Zoom and sharing that with each other. So, you know, some people, if you're lucky enough to be quarantined with a partner or a friend that also is a dancer, they can keep dancing. But for everybody else, Tango is really based on the embrace and the physicality of being connected physically. So we can connect virtually over music, over friendship, but there is no virtual substitute for a hug, you know? So it is really hard. Um, I've done a little bit of individualized practice. You can work on your own technique, but it's almost too sad for me when I, if I put Tango music on, it's sort of like, there's not, nothing that compares to it. So it's sort of being shelved right now a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. uh, we are trying to support the Tango community. So you can imagine that there's a lot of teachers who make their living, you know, um, traveling, being part of festivals, teaching. So some people are trying to teach online. There's a beautiful fundraiser that Ray Sullivan put together locally that's supporting not just um, Tango teachers, but people in the Tango community who are struggling right now. So I do think that's a, a lovely to see that, that communities are coming together around, you know, their own members and trying to make sure everybody is safe, has money for groceries, you know, whatever the immediate financial concern is. So not as much tango right now, but I have been playing the flute a little bit, which is nice. Um, I often don't, I should, I was going to say have the time, but I don't make the time <laughs> for my own music making. I'm surrounded by so much beautiful music making all the time at New World, which is inspiring, but different than making music for yourself. So yeah, I've pulled out a couple of pieces I played in college, some basics, but I also um, brought out the Prokofiev Sonata that I've always wanted to play. Worked on a little bit in college, never have performed. It's really hard, so, you know, it's giving me something to, uh, to work towards. Amazing. Every now and then I pull out the Strauss Concerto and I just read the first it's basically a page and a half without breathing. So <laughs> it's hard. It's hard. So I only do that when I'm feeling especially adventurous, but I, yeah. I feel you on that. How great. 
So you are making space and time for, for creative practice, for reconnecting with your musical roots. You are probably on Zoom many hours of the day. Mm -hmm. um, what are you doing in terms of routines and rituals yourself to, to stay healthy in your mind and your body and your spirit? Mm -hmm. I've kept up um, some things that I normally do. So I have a personal trainer that I work out with twice a week and we've just moved to Zoom <laughs> or Skype actually. So I'm still doing that on Tuesday and Thursday mornings. And, you know, we have enough kind of free weights and things here that I can approximate, you know, the workout that I was doing before. So that's felt really good to keep that going. Um, and I also take Spanish once a week and the same teacher that you used to have, Katzi. Um, so we're still doing our sessions on Zoom on Wednesday nights. So those things have made me feel like my week still has some of the same rhythm. Mm. Um, and then I've been doing a little more Pilates, yoga kind of um, sessions on my own. Um, our friend Rosario has done some sessions from Paris and uh, has been able to email those or share those out. So I've been doing a little bit of that. Haven't been getting outside very much, so would love to um, take some more walks and things, but um, trying to trying to do as much physical activity as possible inside and a little bit of meditation. Um, I don't have as, as grounded a practice as I know that you have, but I do better with guided, like short guided meditation. So there's one particular one on YouTube that I really like, and I listen to that one in the morning. And that really helps set, set me up for the day. Amazing. I have a track I'm going to, I'm going to email to you. I can't wait. <laughs> That's so good. Wow. And what have you found personally to just be the hardest? You're a very resilient person, but you know, tell us like we're, we're all sharing of ourselves and um, yeah. you know, it, this is, this is unprecedented, like you said. So um, you know, how can we support you or how can I as a friend support you and, and how are you just, you know, managing it all? I think just worrying about other people, you know, there was a moment at the beginning where I was even worried for myself or what is this going to mean for me? And I feel like things have settled into kind of a new, I have a groove. It's a new normal. I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> but I still worry about, you know, my brother who works at a grocery store, my parents because of their age or, you know, just everyone who is in that higher risk group. Um, but you know, that doesn't really serve. It doesn't help that much to just, play that in your head. So just checking in on people, making sure they're okay, trying to support people who are struggling. Um, one thing I want to share, so I love Esther Perel, uh, her writings, her books, her podcasts, um, Where Should We Begin is one of them. She has another podcast called Where's, well, I forget, something about work, um, how's work, I think. But she's doing a weekly um, session on YouTube and Facebook, just talking about the experience that we're all going through. So this last week um, was about anticipatory grief and just about grief in general and mm -hmm. how what a lot of us experiencing is actually grief. We're grieving for normal life. We're grieving for the relationships that we can't, the people that we can't see right now. So I've, and they're 45 minutes, they're, they're quick listen, um, but I find her, I just like the way that she thinks and I find it very calming to hear her perspective on that. Um, and she, one of the podcasts she's doing now um, talks to couples um, during quarantine. So it's also just fascinating to get a lens into people's relationships and how they're dealing with that. So I think she's been a great um, resource in this time to just know that so many people around the country are feeling the same thing and going through the same thing. And that helps. too. That's so good. I've been doing a lot of YouTube watching and less the, what is this? And, you know, the sensationalism, but more kind of like, well, what does this mean for the human spirit? And, you know, what are the opportunities we have to look within since now we kind of have to be more because we're doing less. Um, so I've been really, really enjoying that and embracing that side of me to, to your point. Like, you know, I, I have some, I have a lot of rhythm in my life that's, that's regular and normal, but it, it really is me trusting that I'm on the right path and that I'll be shown the way. And that's a totally new way of being for me. I, I'm a strategic planner for God's sake, you know? So mm -hmm. being able to just say like, I'm focusing on now, I'm focusing on today, I'm focusing on tomorrow when I get there is, is definitely a, a new way of being. So yeah, sharing the resources. Esther Perel, somebody else recommended me to her. Um, so I'm gonna check that out, thank you. And all of you, I hope that you, you have a chance to, to check it out as well. 
So Maureen, it's so great to see you. It's so great to talk Likewise. to you. And um, tell us one thing you're hopeful for just before we wrap. Hmm. Um, I think just the human spirit. I believe that we're most of us innately good and I just am heartened by all the examples of that that I'm seeing. Um, that people are craving connection, people are taking care of each other, people are worrying about others, not just about themselves. So every time I see that, it just gives me hope that, you know, this is a really tough time, but we will get through it. Um, and yeah. yeah, I share that. And thank you for, for just giving us that. That's, that's really beautiful. So thank you so much for coming yeah, on. You. If, if you have questions for Maureen, um, feel free to leave a comment. I know the Facebook thing didn't work, but we are going to post this on YouTube. Uh, you can feel free to subscribe there if you like this interview and, and everything else. But this is just an act of service. And like you said at the beginning, in reaching out to make sure people are okay, this is kind of like the digital creative ecosystem version of that for Miami. So thank you so much for, for being part of it, Maureen. And Thanks I hope you have, oh, sure. <laughs> I hope you have a wonderful day. Stay creative. <laughs>